Remain standing as I read one verse of scripture to you from John the 18th chapter and verse 37. John 18 and verse 37. And it says, Pilate therefore said unto him, him is reference to Jesus. Pilate therefore said to him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. And to this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. You may be seated. I want to speak today from the subject, I was born for this. Look at somebody and say, I was born for this. It is good to know what you was born for and good to know what you wasn't born for. Ladies, if you're with a man who hitting you upside your head, you need to know you wasn't born for that. You know, as, as that meme say, ain't nobody got time for that. Okay, ain't, ain't nobody got time. Certain things you, see, w- once you understand what you're born for, that also shows you, lets you know what you wasn't born for. Once you know what you're born for, it causes you to be deliberate and intentional about everything in your life. Once you know what you're born for, it, 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 it causes you to be intentional and deliberate about where you live. That you don't just move somewhere because they got an opportunity there or a job is there. Okay? That you don't follow every man and every woman that, 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 that you seem attracted to. That you don't get in covenant relationships with people that was just supposed to be an incidental relationship. Because once you know what you're born for, it gives your life direction and purpose. And in the context of this scripture here, Jesus is on trial before Pilate. Pilate who was looking for a reason to release him. And then his wife nailed it and she said, listen, I've been dreaming about this man. It ain't good. I I ain't been able to sleep. Leave this man alone. And Pilate eventually says, I find no fault in him. uh, And and he he wants wants to release him. When they said, uh, release them, they said, well, well you got to release somebody, but we'd rather you release the criminal, which was Barabbas, than release Jesus. Some, and, uh, Barabbas didn't even realize he got saved that day because of Jesus too. <laughs> but while he's on trial, Pilate starts asking questions. He said, one of the things he says, because they said, well, this man, uh, they were trying to give, give, give the, the, the government structure a reason to have problems with him. And they said, well, you need to understand, he claimed he a king. And if he a king, then he might overthrow you. He might come across against the government. So Pilate said to him, uh, are you a king? And Jesus answered and said, thou sayest I'm a king. Now, when I was in college, I'll never forget, uh, my freshman year in college, I, I went to a Lutheran, a Lutheran college. Okay? I'm a, uh, some of y'all wonder why we are, quote, unquote, non-denominational church, because I done been through them all. Okay, I'm a mutt. I started off as a, as a high Baptist boy. When I say high Baptist, I mean we didn't, we didn't clap our hands in our church. We sang hymns. And some of y'all, when I see folks holding hymn books, I'm like, I can tell y'all, y'all wasn't as, as dignified. My bad, we knew how to hold a hymn book. When you hold a hymn, you stood like this and you, I mean really, we were taught how to hold a hymn books. And you did it like this, and you, and, you, and you look down and you look up. Standing on the promises of Christ, my King, through eternal ages, let praises ring. Glory, hallelujah, I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the... <laughs> Start off as a Baptist boy. My uncle pastored a Pentecostal storefront church where I went and really got a relationship with Jesus. I got filled with the Holy Spirit there. Went to Catholic school. Went to a Lutheran college. Moved to Maine. Spent a year in the Amy Zion Church. Then I got ordained through the Church of God in Christ. Then I got ordained through a non-denominational church. Uh, then I started right direction. So, uh, but as a result of that, I, I got to understand that there is something that is called liberal theology. 
Liberal theology, those are people who have been taught, they, they may be preachers, they go to church and, and they, uh, uh, they have degrees and, they, and they, uh, uh, they profess to be Christian, but they believe in the message of Jesus without accepting the person of Jesus. Okay, so they say things like, well, Jesus was a good man, but he wasn't God in the flesh. Jesus was a good man, you receive his message, but all this stuff about you know, the blood, and uh, 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 he rose again. All that is stuff that his disciples made up, which means that they are still believing what, uh, what, 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 what the, the Romans told the people, told the God to tell the people that he didn't get, he wasn't raised. Tell them somebody stole his body away. And as a result of that, they don't believe in the supernatural. And I remember uh, as a freshman boy in college at the age of 17, I went to college when I was 17, became uh, eight, got late, uh, 18 that later that semester, but I took a, 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 a class called New Testament Theology. And my professor was a Lutheran professor who I found out, now I understand, was a liberal theologian. And I remember him saying, Jesus never professed to be the son of God. Jesus never professed to be king of the Jews. His disciples made all this up, and he never was trying to start a world religion. As a matter of fact, uh, my daughter, when she first went to New York, she's been in New York about five years now, and praise the Lord, she's still finding her way. Glory to hallelujah. Praise the Lord Jesus. I'm trying to give her a compass. And... Uh, but while she's settling into a good church now, and uh, she even told us she really, she's into church, she's serving, and meets with the pastors, help them plan, and all that kind of stuff. And she called one day, she said, you know, I'm a low-key elder. <laughs> I said, well, what's a low-key elder? She said, well, I get there early, I gotta set the chairs up, I leave late. I said, you just a good usher. <laughs> Don't be trying to give yourself no new titles. I'm a, I'm a, lo I'm a low-key elder. But before she was in this church, that we're happy she's in now, she, she found this church, and, and, and I had never checked, and she told us about this church. I said, well, let me check that church out. And I, and I said, do y'all stream? She said, they stream. And I looked in there, and it was, it was an a, 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 a evening Bible study, uh, and I was able to stream it. And uh, I looked, and I saw her sitting there, and the, and the pastor was up saying all this stuff about being saved and born again and, and all that and going to heaven. It ain't about that. Jesus didn't come to do that. He just came to help us to know how to live on the earth and treat people right. And I, I, I'm texting her, leave now. Leave. Okay? And, you know, if, I, if she could have saw my, if I could have FaceTimed her, I would have did like on, like on the movie Get Out. Run. But based upon this scripture, this professor was saying Jesus never professed to be the king never professed to be savior because uh, uh, if you look at it based upon how we talk today, Jesus didn't give him a straight answer, but keep on reading. So Pilate said, are you a king? Are you, are you the king of the Jews? Are you professed to be king? And Jesus said, thou sayest that I am a king. You got to understand, Jesus had a little bit of swag to him. So you got to, let me give you interpretation. You said it. You a king? You said it. You, you, you just answered your own question. You said, and then, but then he goes on, which makes it even plainer, to this end, for the purpose of being a king was I born, and for this cause came I into the world. Jesus, I was born for this. I was born at this time in this place to occupy this space. It is something, y'all, that is overwhelmingly liberating and empowering about knowing why you were born. I've seen people, I've been pastoring for a number of years, and unfortunately I've seen people survive great tragic accidents. And, and so I don't make this up because I know it's happened a couple of times. Someone is in a bad car accident and the car is totaled and the car flips over a few times and they walk out of it with barely a scratch. And all of a sudden they have an epiphany and they say stuff like, I'm here for a reason. God got me here for, and then some people say, I, maybe I'm supposed to preach. Maybe you're supposed to slow down. Maybe you're supposed to not have ball tires. Maybe it ain't that deep. It ain't that spiritual, okay? Maybe the blood just still works. Come on now. 
Maybe God's trying to t tell you nothing other than to slow down and realize and don't take life for granted. And so, so what happens, people go through some, something tragic and then they have this wake up, this, this epiphany about purpose. I'm supposed to be I'm for a reason. I'm here for a reason. I'm supposed to be doing something. Can I tell you, you don't need an accident to know you're here for purpose. Your car don't have to flip over 10 times. The truth of the matter is no one is born without purpose. No one is born without unique purpose and a unique assignment. And you just got to walk in the path that God has for you and walk with him so that you can discover your purpose beyond yourself of just wanting a good job, a boo and a bay, and a nice car. Come on, look at somebody and say, it got to be more than this. Got to be, come on, come. Because, cause, because the thing is, and it, it's so unfortunate, Solomon had to go through it. It's unfortunate that some people, they get all that and then discover it got to be more than this. They get the car that they, that they thought that they were saving for. Get the car and they're like, no, nah, I got to be, this ain't it, this ain't it. I still got that itch way back here that the car just is not satisfying. I mean, you believe if you can just, if you can just get a tall blue black man. Yes, sir. A Mandingo warrior kind of man. I need a Wesley Snipe black man. On the other hand, you say, no, I just, I need me a Mario Peebles. Curly, wavy hair, light-skinned man, you know. Some brothers say, I, I, I just need that big booty woman. Yes, sir. Yes, Lord. Some of them say, no, I don't like them big. If I can get a skinny one, I, and then you get the big one, you get the short one, you get the fat one, you get the dark one, you get the, you get the light one, and you still find out a man don't do it. A woman don't do it. Get the house, and you get what you want, and then you don't want what you got. Because the Bible says that a man's life consists not in the abundance of things that he possesses. Yeah, I, I, I know. And, and I can honestly tell you, as somebody who has some stuff now, life is not about stuff. So Solomon had to come and realize. He said, you know, he said, the more stuff you get, the more responsibility you got. He said, you got to maintain this stuff. You got to keep this stuff, you know. And then, and, then, and then you get a wife who you love who, who, who won't let you fix the stuff when you want to fix the stuff. Every time the stuff breaks, every time she hears something, she wants you to do something immediately to the stuff. You know, you got to do this. You got to do that. You got to do this. Now you wish I'd have had this stuff. We have, we have a bench by our bed. We have a bench by a bed, and I kept, I kept, kept meaning to tighten the thing. I kept meaning to tighten it. I said, I said I'm going to tighten that. I'm going to tighten that, please. I'm going to tighten the stool, stool in front of the bed. And, uh, and, and uh, uh, all of a sudden, the other day, she said, this, this bench broke. I didn't see it. She, I think she fell. You didn't fall? Yeah, but it fell, and I almost couldn't. It was almost like Humpty Dumpty. You couldn't put it back together again, okay? Stuff breaks. Things got to be maintained, okay? That nice car it really, they mean it when they say premium gas. Okay, now you can mess around if you want to and try to put the cheapest El Cheapo in there. Okay, it'll mess up your engine. And so you realize it was, stuff is not all it's cracked up to be. There's got to be something more than this. So something overwhelming and liberating and empowering. Dr. King once said that a man who does not have something for which he is willing to die is not fit to live. And I would add a qualified to that statement because you can't know that for which you're willing to die until you know the reason you were born. Otherwise, you could be dying for the wrong thing. You could be dying for something God never intended for you to die for. And then you're not alive for what he wanted you to be here for. And every, come, some of y'all need to get this. Every cause ain't your cause. Every need is not the call. You're not supposed to be in every protest. Okay? Yeah, some of y'all are like, man, if I was back there, you know, I would have been out there on Freedom Rider. No, you should have stayed right where you were because as soon as they pulled you, you would have been running the Lord Jesus. God. <laughs> thank God for those who did, and thank, but thank God for the time you were born because God knows your purpose. You were born when you were born for such a time as this. 
A bird isn't afraid of heights because he was born for this. Fish isn't afraid of water because he was born for water. A bear isn't afraid of woods. I am. <laughs> we got woods by my house and, we, and uh, right, right, you know, Pastor Marcy, she usually walks the dog. This one particular day, I decided to walk the dog with her. And, uh, and so right, uh, we, we walk right around five minutes from the house. There's woods there. But we go to the other side of the woods, through the road, through the street. And this day, we decide we're going to walk back through the woods. And usually five minutes, five minutes, five minutes, five minutes there, five minutes back. Five. We're walking for about a half hour. <laughs> and I realized, no house. Where are we? No house and no yellow brick road. Okay? This must be an old town road and I don't have a horse. <laughs> we walking and we walking and we walking. I'm like, our house is five minutes away. Where are, I don't know where we went. Okay? And then every time I heard something, I'm like, <laughs> I didn't have a gun. I didn't have a rifle. Okay? But uh, so I, found, I discovered the woods is not my element. The woods is the bear's element. A lion isn't afraid of the jungle, but I am. Because they're in their element. Once you are in your element, what is fearful to other people doesn't scare you. Because for this purpose you were born. Once you were in your element, what's hard for other people is easy for you. Because you come to realize, for this purpose I was born. I was born born for this. There's some of you sitting right there right now who say stuff like, man, I don't know how you get up here every Sunday and preach in front of all these people, stand in front of all these people. But I was born for this. I was born for this. There, there's some of you, there's some of y'all who look at Pastor Marcy and, and hear my examples of, I don't know how she had, Lord, she's been around him how 35 years. Ain't no way. Ain't no way I could be mad to, to Bishop Bear. Lord, Jesus, he would get on my nerve. But she was born for this. When you're born for it, you can handle what other people can't handle. When you're born for it, you can take what other people can't take because you're in your element. So once you know purpose, you can function in your element. So the, this whole discussion, it comes down to the issue of purpose. Now all of us have, don't have the benefit of knowing our purpose very early on as a child. I did as an adolescent, okay? I, I didn't understand the word called, at that time, but it was New Year's Eve. I was 12 years old, December 31st, now January 1st, okay? I'm the youngest of five children. Everybody else is out partying, including my mother and her boyfriend. I'm home by myself. This is started off crying because I was mad and scared and all that, but I ended up praying. End up praying, and I heard God tell me as he could talk to a child, tell my people about heaven. And I started telling my family, I'm going to preach. I, 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 I would love to say I said I'm called. I didn't understand call. I just said I'm going to preach. And they started telling the pastor and started telling the people I'm going to preach. And then when I got around my, my spiritual mother on, on birth of Mother Bailey, she started telling me, you called. And then when she started telling me I was called, she told me, you can't play cards because you called. So you can't be wearing those, y'all don't know nothing about this, those short ass jeans. <laughs> y'all don't know nothing, I'm telling my age now. You can't wear those short ass jeans because you called. She told me I couldn't wear shorts because I was calling. Friday night, all the teenage Christians in the church, most of us had church on Friday night. We would meet up around 11, 12 o'clock midnight and go do midnight bowling. And she said, you, could, you, you can't be going that bowling because you called. When I was in high school, we had, we, we was into backgammon, and backgammon was, I even forgot how to play backgammon now. We used to stay and have backgammon contests and backgammon clubs, and I carried my briefcase. It looked like it was a backgammon set, and I came to Bible study one night straight from, from, from school, and she said, you got a new briefcase for, for your Bible? I said, no, this is backgammon. She said, what? I opened it up. She said, I said, what's that? I, I opened it up. I said, it's called back. She said, get those dice out this church. I don't care if it's back gambling or front gambling or side gambling you called <laughs> the only thing I came understood about called is that I changed my mind <laughs> uh, maybe calling ain't fun but I came to understand I was called. And likewise, Jeremiah, the first chapter, we see Jeremiah. I don't know his age, but, but it's believed that he's a young child. 
Because God tells him, don't say I'm a young man. God said, don't say I'm a child. God speaks to Jeremiah regarding his calling. He's, he's a child. Jeremiah 1 and 5, and he says, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew you. We get into debates. We make it a political thing between pro-choice and pro-life. When does life begin? Life began before you was born, according to the scripture. Before I formed thee, I knew thee. Ah, before you became an embryo, or as I heard Bishop Jake say, before your grandfather saw your great-grandmother at the, at the church picnic and said, girl, let's go for a walk. <laughs> I formed thee. In the belly, before I formed thee in the belly, before your mother conceived you. I'm jumping ahead of myself. I'd already done some research on this. Before 250 million sperm was in a rush to get to one egg to form you. Whew. See, I'm jumping ahead of myself because uh, I'm, I'm just going to give you a little appetite. I can't get to it this week. But you were born to win. It's in my notes. I'll come back and say it next week, but I'm just going to give you a little, a, a, a little teaser. You was a winner before you was born. Okay? Watch this. We're born in sin and shaped in iniquity. You was a winner before you was born, so you was a winner sinner. If you was a winner sinner, how you going to be a losing saint? I'll come back to that next week. I'll, I'll come back to that next week. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew you. And before you came out of your mother's womb, I sanctified you. Now, now, which means, let me explain it. We were in spirit form before we became natural form. The Bible said that God is the father of spirits. That's why you got to get born again. Okay? Okay, uh, you know, you know we, we, we talk about we want to we wanna look like him and be like Jesus. Come on, we ain't talking about uh, we want to look like him physically, okay? We, we, he's the father of spirits. Before I formed thee, I knew you in spirit form before you became in natural form. He said, and I sanctified you, which means I put you aside and ordained you, meaning I separated you. God said, before you were born, I had already an assignment. I had a calling. I had a path for you. Now I said, now, now, now I need them to be born so they can get on this path. And then Paul says stuff like this. He said, you're going to have to seek them. Because God wants us to seek him. If you seek, you shall find him. Happily, you find him. And once you seek him out, now he reveals the path, the destiny to you. He says, I'm not just going to automatically just put you on it. I delight in you seeking me. I delight in you recognizing that you need me. I, I delight in this search that I need to know God. And I, I, I need to have a deeper walk. And I need him to talk to me. And I, and I need some, some revelation, some inspiration and some insight beyond where I, I want you to seek me. He says that I don't want you to seek me because I'm merely playing with you. I want you to seek me so I can strengthen you. I have a, a, a my, my, my not, 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 not my youngest now, but I have a toddler grand, grandson and when he was learning to walk, okay, you would, you would stand him up Okay, and you say, come on, and then as he walks towards you, you keep backing up. And he's walking, you keep backing up. And it's not that you want him to fall. No, I want you to stand stronger. Okay, and sometimes you feel like God's backing up from you. He said, come on, come on, uh, uh, come on, get, get yourself together. Uh, but I, 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 get up, I'm right here, I'm right here, get on, get on up. It's not that God's left you, he's just backing up, saying, come on, come on, come a little closer, come a little closer, get up, get yourself together, brush yourself off. I got purpose for you beyond this fall. I got purpose for you beyond your mistake. I have purpose for you beyond your dilemma. I have purpose on you beyond what you're feeling right here. Get yourself up and keep on walking. She said, before I formed you, I knew you. Before you came out the womb, I said to her, I found you and I ordained you to be a prophet to the nation. So, so this purpose, understanding, purpose that I was born for this is empowering. Understanding the purpose is liberating. It's emboldening. It's emboldening. It makes you Bold. They tried to tell Peter and John, 
Don't y'all preach anymore in the name of Jesus. They took him and they beat him. And they said, now preach again in the name of Jesus. We'll do it again. And uh, Peter said, uh, we can't preach and teach except what we heard. Now, you figure out whether we're supposed to obey God or obey you. Boy, that's bold. That's bold. You know why? He said, I, this, that's why I followed Jesus around for three years. I spent most of my life fishing. <laughs> but I discovered about three years ago that all the money I was making from fishing wasn't it. I found out that the principles I was learning from fishing was really about God taking those, that natural uh, desire to catch and to conquer and to take people out of this and bring them over here. I discovered that he really wanted to make me a fisher of men. Is it possible that what You've been doing all your life, ain't it? It was just to prepare you for what is it? Most of Jesus' disciples, he didn't call. Everybody didn't have the privilege of knowing when they were 12 what they're supposed to do. Everybody didn't have the privilege of knowing, as Jeremiah did as a child, that you're dating that I called you. We, 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 we do our pursuits. We go to college. We, get, we, 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 get, we, we, we major in this, and we follow this. And some of us, we don't even know how we got into what we got into. We just kind of stumble into it, and now we're making money, and we, I can't make no money doing anything else. I just need to hang in there, and we don't even think about purpose anymore because all we're doing, we're being led by money. Our life just consists of getting bills paid. And I'm telling you, God wants you to live deeper than that. He wants you to live with a higher sense of purpose than just getting the bills paid. Because can I tell you, the bills is the least of the problem from God's standpoint. Because he promised us if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these other things will be added to you. And I can preach that not just by knowing that it's in the scripture in Matthew, in Matthew 6.33, but I can preach it because I lived it. That when I got fired for my man, uh, uh, for my corporate job, okay, when, when I had worked 10 years to get the salary that I was making, I thought I had arrived. Thought I arrived. And now my daughter in law, she start, she start at what I worked for 10 years to get to in the same profession as a claims adjuster. And I got fired. And I, 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 now I got fired. See, I can say I got fired now. You don't tell folks you got fired when you got fired. <laughs> you tell them the company's going through some things. <laughs> you say, uh, the, the company restructured. <laughs> yeah, they, uh, um, um, <laughs> oh, oh, here's our spiritual thing. My season was up there. <laughs> My season was up. Yeah, and I didn't know how I was going to make it. My wife didn't know how we was going to make it. But all we knew is that God told us to do what we were supposed to do. And he, and he told me to cancel the interviews I had. And he told me to stop trying to be an executive recruiter for my wife. Stop sending her resumes around without her, with her knowing it, setting up interviews for her. And she didn't even know. I just said, just show up. <laughs> and he told me to seek him. And everything else has, has manifested from me being in purpose. Which is why... I'm at the most secure place I've ever been because everything I have, God gave it to me. It is something to know. Oh, I'm going deeper. That you are God made man. Ooh. It is so liberating to know that this joy you have, the world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. It's something about knowing that God will bless the work of your hand. It's something about knowing that if I, I can make my way prosperous by doing the word and I can have good success and can nobody stop it and nobody block it as long as I keep my ear to his mouth, he's going to lead me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. 
He's going to cause me to lie down in green passion. If I get depressed, he's going to restore my soul. And I know it looks scary sometimes, but yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for I know you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I know I walk in the favor of God. Well, how do you know you walk in the favor of God? By this I know that thou favoreth me because my enemies have not triumphed over me. That's how I know I walk in the favor of God because the devil couldn't win and the devil couldn't stop me and the devil couldn't hinder me and the devil's will couldn't be done and I made it through that and I made it through this and when nobody said I won't make it and when it made no sense to nobody God brought me through look at somebody say I was born for this I was born I was I was born for this I was born for this. I was, I'm in my element. I'm in my element. I was born for this. I know you can't do it, but I can do it because I was born for this. I know you can't take it, but I can take it because I was born for it. I know you can't go there, but I can go there. I, but I know you're scared, but I ain't scared because I was born for this. Jesus knew why he was born. He knew who he was. He knew what he was to do, and he knew what he would have to go through to fulfill God's purpose and calling on his life. It is so important that you just not understand the purpose. It's, understand, it's important that you understand the process. A lot of people understand purpose, but they don't know process. See, I was called, but there's process. That's the purpose, but there's process to fulfill purpose. And a lot of people, as soon as you find purpose, you want to just run and jump the purpose. But there's a process to fulfill purpose. Jesus says this. He's, his, his, this is process scripture. Until you've been faithful in that which another man's, God's not going to give you your own. Until you've been faithful in little things, then I'll give you greater things. See, all that's process. You know, one of the greatest things about being a or, or, or when I mean to say greatest, one of the potentially uh, 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 saddest things on one of the dilemmas about being a pastor of a large church and a bishop even over other pastors who, who are ambitious and, and want to hear God and believe God is that sometimes we do things and as an overseer and as a pastor, I have to say stuff like, you're not ready for that. And people don't want to hear that. How many of y'all know just because you can make a baby don't mean you're ready to be a mother or a father? See, some of my teenagers don't know that. Because you can be biologically ready and not mentally ready. You can be biologically ready and not uh, psychologically ready and not, and, and not economically ready. And so sometimes you have to say, no, nah, you're, not, you're not ready for that. Pastor of a, uh, a, a, a smaller church told me I had an opportunity to go on television. I said, why? I heard Charles Stanley say something years ago. Okay, we're on national television now. We're on national, we're, we're, we're on one, and we'll probably only be on one. And if we, do, and we gotta come off that, we'll come off that, because what I'm committed to, what the Lord told me I have to do, is local television. But uh, I heard Charles Stanley, I was reading an article many years ago about television ministry. And he was talking about preachers and pastors spending all their money trying to become some national figures. And he said, if nobody want to hear you locally, <laughs> what makes you think people want to hear you nationally? If nobody comes to your church locally, why are you trying to get on a national platform? Because people don't understand process. When we first started our church, there was a, there was a man in our church, and he, was, he, was, he, he meant well. He just wouldn't do well, and he refused to go through process. And, uh, you know, Pastor Chandler, my son, you know, started off, he started off as our youth pastor, and God's opened up all kinds of doors. Now, he's preached on platforms I haven't even preached on, okay? He's got bigger honorariums than, than, I, than I've even gotten. Imagine that in 35 years. But it's all right. I ain't jealous of nothing. <laughs> because what he's walking in is, is his, his inheritance. What he's walking in is doors that my faithfulness have opened up for him, Okay? And, uh, uh, but, but I remember saying that young man uh, at that time, 
At that time, when our, when our young man was here, uh, uh, Brother Jeremy Harry, who may be here, sitting here in the sanctuary or may be back there working or something, uh, he, he's now a young man, he, but he was a young adolescent teenager at the time. And we had a, and my son Chandler, he was even younger, but we had some other teenagers. We had maybe about four or five teenagers. And I said, uh, uh, he believed the Lord called him to have an international youth ministry. Uh, international youth. I said, well, that's wonderful. Well, praise God. I said, well, we got a few young people, adolescent teenagers. Why don't you start working with them and do some? He said, no, 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 no. I'm not called to do that. I'm supposed to have an international, not even national. <laughs> now, Jesus talks about process. He said, first you're going to be witnesses in Jerusalem. That's where you feel, give, feel the Holy Ghost. In Samaria, that's the county. Okay. Uh, in Jerusalem, in, 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 in Samaria, uh, what, what else, uh, in Judea, the region, and then to the animal apostles. Jesus said, okay, you got to show your faithfulness here locally, and then let me now increase the diameter. But see, some people, they want to go right to the end of the purpose without understanding process. Last I know, he's not even doing that ministry anymore. It never became, I, I, I can't say God didn't show him that. What, I, what I'm saying is he wouldn't go through process, because this is how God works. God works, he says, he's, this is how God works. God says, see the, see the stars in the sky? That's how much I'm going to bless you. Pick up some sand. Start counting it. I can't count that sand. It's too many. That's how many I'm going to bless you. And then he says, now let's go get started with one. That's called process. A lot of us... We all, we all enamored, we're thrilled about the purpose, and we don't understand process. And then so you have to tell people you're not ready for that yet. And though, and though you're, oh, your gift, your gift can be greater than your process. Just because you're gifted to do it don't mean you're ready to do it. We told people stuff like this. You got to work these kinks out behind the stage in the green room before you ever get on the stage. We tell people things just because everybody invites you to speak don't mean you're ready to speak. Because you don't understand that just like y'all can see me more than I can see you right now, just like I'm, a, I'm the big, the, uh, you know, God forbid something drastic was going on here, I am right now the number one target in this place just because of my proximity. When you get to a certain level, you become a target. A target of the devil. And many times people are on a platform that they don't have the armor on yet. Who? To shield themselves against all the fiery darts that's going to come against you because you let everybody know I'm called now. And you're taking shots you weren't prepared to take. Can I tell you, if you don't want shots, you don't want nobody talking about you, and thank God, I think it's calming down now, but y'all know just a couple years ago, everybody was talking about their enemies. Everybody talking about haters. You know, I was, I was following one person in our, in our church, you know, just being nice, trying to follow members in our church, you know, just trying to make them feel like somebody following them. Make them feel like you got a friend other than Jesus. And I'll never forget, I don't remember who it was, but they wrote, to all my haters, wait, you got me following you and two other people. You got three followers. Who are your haters? Who are your haters? I'm following you because I love you. I'm sorry because I feel sorry for you. I want you to be somebody. I want you to have some self-esteem. And so a lot of times people are talking about haters. Can I tell you, if you want to do anything great, you're going to have haters. You don't want to have haters. You, don't want, you want to have everybody like you blend in. Once you step out from the crowd, once you talk different, act different, once you act like you got some confidence, once you really carry yourself like, you know, I really don't need you, because in, in God I trust, all the rest of y'all can um, trust somebody else. <laughs> When, well, come on, when, when, come on. When, when you walk with a certain amount of confidence, when you know that you're a God-made man. See, people think, pe some people call me arrogant. I am the exact opposite of arrogant because I ain't good enough. I ain't smart enough. Come on, I, I heard somebody say one time, I was talking to a preacher, he said, I'm, I'm real smart. 
He said, I'm smart. I said, Lord Jesus. Because just when you think you're smart, God will let you go through something. You realize how dumb you are. And you realize you need him. I ain't that smart. Everything you see here, it's been, you know, I'm, 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 in, I'm, in, a, I'm in an executive leadership program right now through, 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 um, through Cornell University. Now I just got names for stuff. I got names for stuff I've been doing all along by the Spirit of God. <laughs> I got proof through studies that this is true. I was already being led by the Spirit of God. I just didn't know it was called that. Come on, I didn't have a name for that, but I know God told me to do what I was doing. See, I'm a God-made man. When you know you're a God-made man and a God-made woman, you don't go around kissing people's apples. Somebody just got offended. Look at him, he's telling me, he said apples. What, what did you think he said? Yeah. You don't go around trying to be somebody you're not. You don't go around doing all this code switching, dude. You are who you are. That's why I love my daughter here, Minister Joyce. Minister Joyce is Joyce. She country. She country with a K. From Johnsonville, South Carolina. When she come up here and pray, she ain't, gonna, she ain't putting up no airs. This morning, our Heavenly Father, oh gracious one. She go here, Daddy, we need you, Daddy. Come on now. I'm just hear Pastor Dollar say, these preachers go around talking like this or with all this what all the ecclesiastical religiosity whatever they talk oh god bless you brother god bless you beloved beloved we come before you today he said oh stop it do you talk like that all the time when you get with your wife and the baby tomorrow beloved would thou with like it to conjugate tonight stop it come on God wants you to know who you are, know your purpose, that you don't, you're not fake. God wants to use authentic people. The good, the bad, and the ugly. What you are, where you came from. He said, come on, tell your story. I'll work it in. I'll get glory. When they realize where you're from and see where you are, they'll know there is a God. There is a God. So Jesus knew why he was born. John the Baptist knew why he was born. Look at John the first chapter. John the first chapter talks about John the Baptist. It says, first of all, it starts off, it said there was a man who sent from God. It's interesting, it's, it's interesting. In the beginning, uh, John 1 1, in the beginning was the word, word was with God, word was with God. That's talking about Jesus, but then it start, immediately starts talking about John, John the Baptist. John 1 and 6, he said there was a man sent from God whose name was John, and the same came for a witness. A witness, a representative, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him, the one he was bearing the light for, might be saved. He, John, was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. The Bible tells us John's whole purpose. John's whole purpose was to be a heralder, was to be a precursor, was to be the opening act for Jesus. Now, come on, y'all know most stars, whether it's a comedian, whether it's a singer, whether it's whatever, you, you don't spend your life planning on being an opening act. I, I'm an opening act as long as I got to be the opening act until I'm the main attraction, then somebody else going to open for me. That was never John's purpose. John was called by God from the foundation of the world to be an opening act a six-month opening act. And for this purpose, he was born. He was born for a six-month ministry that he fully loved and fully embraced. Now, I know we all have our plans. We all have our purposes. We have our ambitions. We have our dreams. But have you ever accepted the fact of what God has for you makes it different from perhaps what you want? The truth of the matter is, 
Everybody ain't called to be a senior pastor. Even though they're a good preacher. This whole bishop thing, Bishop Rick, I'm just now called Bishop thing. The Bishop Rick is a whole nother level. I'm dealing with some stuff now with some pastors. And I said to Pastor Mars, are we trying to help the people? I said, and this is somebody's bishop. Worse than that, I said, before that, he's somebody's pastor. You know, something, it would be all right if you didn't have other folks looking for you. Something we could tolerate if you wasn't in a position to be governing other people and instructing other people. Look, look at James, uh, James, the third chapter, verse one. Put that up for me. James 3 and verse 1. Praise God. Hallelujah. James 3 and verse 1, it says, My brethren, and after this, I want you to put it up in the New Living Translation and maybe the uh, Amplified. Say, My brethren, uh, be not many masters. That's not talking about a slave owner. It's talking about being a teacher, someone who's over other people. Knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. He said, when you teach other people, when you speak to other people, when you're on this platform, let me go deeper. When you're in a supervisory position, when you're in a management position, when you're the captain, when you're the owner, we're going to receive greater condemnation. Now, you need to understand that this condemnation is not talking about God. Because God doesn't condemn us. There's no condemnation of them in Christ Jesus. Every time we see condemnation, God says, don't condemn yourself and the thing you do. It's not that God's going to condemn you. It's people. In other words, he said, people got a right to hold you to a higher standard. I talk about this in my book, In Whom There's No Guile. Okay? Put that up from the, from the uh, other translation for me, uh, New Living Translation. Uh, my brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church. Y'all know everybody won't be teaching in the church. For we who teach will be judged more strictly. You got to know what you're born for. Put up message, not message, uh, amplified. May, may sound real loud because it's amplified. <laughs> not many of you <laughs> should become teachers, self-constituted censors and reprovers of others, my brethren, for you know that we teachers will be judged by higher standard and with greater severity than other people. Thus we assume the greater accountability and the, and the more condemnation. That's why I can't stand here preachers say when you do something stupid, well, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm just like you. I'm flesh and blood just like you, you know. Yeah, I'm flesh and blood, but I accepted the fact I got a high responsibility and a high accountability, and if you ain't ready for the heat, get out the kitchen. So is it possible, based upon who you are, what you can handle, you're where God wants you to be? Is it possible whoo, that your call to be the second legs on the team. And you might not ever be the starter. The devil is a liar. That, 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 see that, that, I know it's supposed to come to this church. No, 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 there, there. Uh, I, I was watching the game. Did you watch the game last night, the, uh, 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 the Warriors and the Lakers? Did you watch the game? Who won? I, the Lakers looked like they were winning. That's why I started. Well, he was, he was, he was giving me to be a blow away. Um, but um, Stephen Curry's not playing, is he? Okay. He's injured, obviously. He's, he's injured, and he's not playing. So he can't carry the team all the time. He needs somebody, even though he is the face of the team, to be there if he can't be there. Is it possible God wants you to be a good supporter? Is it possible? You might not start, but guess what? When they get the ring, now, that ain't going to happen for the Warriors this season. But anyway, <laughs> when they used to get the ring, everybody on the team get the ring. Even the supporters, even those who were second string, even those who got called up from the G League for one game. Sometimes... You will be less anxious. I don't know. This must take a whole other direction for this sir. You'll be less anxious, less jealous, 
You're less, you, you, you won't compare yourself to other people if you recognize I was born for this. Not that, this. I plan on working it in, but I didn't work it in, but since he's sitting here, y'all know when I see, him, see my kids, I always think about them using them for examples. But this, this is a good one, it's all right. <laughs> it's all right. Daniel is the tallest one in my family. He's 6'5". He's 6'5", and he plays basketball. He didn't start playing basketball. He didn't become, start playing basketball, okay, and then all of a sudden got 6'5". He was 6'5", so he can enhance and progress and dominate in basketball. Now, he had a basketball long before he was 6'5". Okay? Nobody else is 6'5". I ain't 6'5". Pastor Marcy ain't 6'5". Chandler ain't 6'5". Okay? Uh, who's the other ones? Tyler. <laughs> Don't tell him that he ain't watching the street. <laughs> Tyler's not 6'5". Kendra's not 6'2", you know, though, right? 6'2"? 5'11". 5'11". There you go. 5'11". <laughs> They're all taller than me. <laughs> but my point is, is that 6'5 is part of his purpose. You see? 6'5 is, so God had purpose for him and then help him to grow into the purpose. Are, are y'all listening to me? Now, somebody else, that ain't your purpose. You don't need to be 6'5". You can cover it all day. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that. He said, which of you by worrying can add one cubit to your stature? He said, you can worry all day long. If that's not what God has for you, that's not what God has for you. You're going to have to learn to be content with this is where God has me, and I was born for this. Let me start wrapping this up here. About to close now. <laughs> that only matters if you know how many doors in the message. <laughs> All right. So John the Baptist says, uh, he that's coming after me is greater than me, preferred before me. That's John 1 and 27. He says, who shoe latch it, I'm not worthy to unloose. John says in John 3, 28 through, 20, 28 through 30, he said, you to yourself bear witness. I'm not the Christ, but I'm sent before him. He said, I know my purpose. He that the bride, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom was standing with and heareth him rejoicing because of the bridegroom's voice. He said, I'm, I'm excited for his day. You know, it's nothing more pitiful then have a bridesmaid who's jealous of the bride. And you got them at your wedding. Mm -hmm. I don't know how she got him. She ain't even that cute. You're there to be a bridesmaid. You're there to celebrate. As a matter of fact, just a little passing point. I'm trying to help y'all. Because y'all know. People don't even know. Ain't nobody, nobody supposed to wear white, white on that day except the bride. I wore white on my, my wedding day because my friend had said, I'm wearing white, so I said, I'm wearing white too. Now, really, now I'm no better. I said, I, I wouldn't even walk, wear white. Nobody's supposed to wear white except the bride. And then some people walk up in the wedding, a guest, and they're wearing white and got it all laced out too. <laughs> he, said, he said, You got to know how to celebrate on somebody else's day and not make it about you. Ah, we just need folks today. There's some scriptures in the Bible. I said, Lord, I, said, I need people like that. Uh, uh, David comes, uh, he wants to do something, and, and Jonathan says, all that's in your heart, just do it. The Bible said people, so, so many people surrounded themselves around David. He said, and they came with one heart and singleness of purpose to make David king. They understood the anointing of God is on him, and I'm just glad to be part of the team. John the Baptist said, he said, the friend of the bridegroom, he's going to rejoice with him. And then he says this, he must increase, I got to decrease. 
He, is, he said, he said I'm, I'm here for a six-month ministry, and I'm not going to try to hang over. It's now all about Jesus. His disciples said, Lord, uh, 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 John, you know, we've been having these nice meetings down here at the Jordan, but you see folks ain't coming here no more. They're going over to the synagogue and over there to the side of the mountain where Jesus preaches. And John says, I'm glad because that's what it was all about from the beginning. He must increase, I must decrease, I know my purpose. After Paul has had his encounter with Jesus, Jesus reveals to Paul his purpose. Now, now, Paul already was religious. He was a Pharisee. He was a religious leader. The Pharisees, they specifically believed in a resurrection. The Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrection. That's why they were called the Sads, you see, because if, if you don't believe there's going to be life after this one, you're sad, you see. Okay. And uh, so he was already religious. He was so religious, he was a zealot. He, when he was trying to persecute the Christians, he thought he was doing right. He wasn't trying to be mean. He was trying to stop these people from perverting the Orthodox Judaism. And he's on his way to kill them or to put them in jail or to beat them or to threaten them. And on his way... There, Acts 9 says that the Lord knocked him off his beast. He was blinded, but he heard the voice saying, half you'd kick against the pricks. And then he said, what do, you want to, what, what do you want me to do, Lord? He said, go into the, go into the city and quiet in the house of Ananias. He's going to tell you what to do. But when we come to Acts 26, Paul gives us more specifics about what happened on that day. In Acts 26, starting in verse 15, Paul gives us more, more details. He said, on that day, I said, Lord, who are you? And he said, I'm Jesus who you persecuted. And then he says... Arise, stand on your feet. I've appeared unto thee for this purpose. I've appeared to you to make you a minister and a witness of the things which you have seen and of things which I will appear to you. Revelation I'm going to give you. Then verse 17 he says, And I'm delivering you from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I now send thee. Now this is, this is profound. Because he says, now in order for me to do what I want to do with you, I know you have been brought up in a particular church. I know you've been brought up with particular doctrine. I know you've been brought up in a particular family, in a particular way of, of thinking, and a particular custom. But in order for me to do what I'm going to do with you, then I'm going to have to deliver you from the people, from them. And then he says, and then this is even more profound. And I'm also delivering you from the Gentiles unto whom now I'm sending you. Know what he says? He says, Paul, from here out, you're my man. You are my man. I'm delivering you from where you came from and the people I'm sending you to, I don't want you to get addicted to them either. What, why is this? He said, because if you stay connected to them, you're going to say, well, this ain't how I was raised and I always heard. He said, and if you get too, too addicted to them, you'll never tell them what I want you to tell them because you'll be kissing up to them and you'll be afraid you're going to lose members and you won't tell them the truth uh, because you want to appease people and just scratch people's ears because the Bible says there's going to come a day when people have itching ears, only, only want to sit under people who tell them what they want to hear and and never challenge them to grow in their faith. Which tells us Paul realized there's going to be people who accept me and, be, and there's going to be people who reject me. And he was prepared for it because he says, I was born for this. So as we conclude here, once you know why you're born and understand purpose, Events along the path of purpose don't shock you. Don't rattle you. Don't derail you. Now, I'll be honest. I, God bless uh, Senator Scott here, but uh, you know, you know, we, we, we've, often, we, we've joked about it in staff meeting. I, one time I was talking about I was going to, maybe I run for governor. Uh, I just got inspired after Trump became president. I said, I can be anything. <laughs> I just got inspired. Anything you do, I can do better. I can do anything better than you. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. <laughs> and so, so they would, we would joke about it. And I would say, there's some things I say around my staff, because they know me that I can't say to y'all. And every now and then I'll say something. They say, see, Pastor, that's why you can't be governor. 
See, you can't be saying that. You, you can, sometimes I'm just joking. They say, but no, you can't joke like that. If you're in politics, you're going to take some shots. Everybody ain't going to like you. Okay? You know, we are, we are now talking about what a great legend Kobe was. Okay? Everybody liked Kobe, great guy, and all this. Even Gail wished he only said nice things about Kobe. <laughs> Y'all pray for Gail. We need, we need to start, uh, have some shirts or something. Pray for Gail. Lord, ain't nobody giving Gail a break. Nobody. Okay? I, I, I said something nice to her. I, I, said, I said, I watched the whole thing. I said, yeah, you shouldn't have said that. I said, but... <laughs> I said... I said, but my son said you cancel. I said, but I'll see you in the morning. <laughs> you going, everybody talking about how great Kobe was, but on the court, Kobe wasn't your friend. I said, on the court, he wasn't your friend. See, you can't be in the game and win and then want to be everybody's friend. <laughs> You may have to knock somebody down. You may have to steal a ball. Come on now. You may have to dive something. While you're diving, you don't mean to hurt somebody, but they get hurt. Okay? I watched, I watched LeBron yesterday. He went, to, he went to go and fell all over the people, and then after he stopped, he helped them up and said, you all right here? But their nose could have been broke, whatever, but he's going to get right back in that game. Sometimes there's casualties along the way, and you have to know that whatever path you are on, there's some good with it, and there's some bad with it. There's some up days, there's some down days. And a lot of us, we only want the good days. You know, that's why, that's why I, you know, and some of my colleagues, they do it. You know, when, when you preach the gospel, if people are going to say stuff, especially if you don't hide stuff. You know, I ain't hiding nothing from my, I'm, I'm a blessed man. God been good to me. I was poor, now I'm rich. God is a good God, and I ain't ashamed to tell it because I didn't rob nothing, I didn't steal nothing. And well, no, no, nobody said nothing when I was riding around in a raggedy car with, with, with the lining coming down out, off, off from my roof. I had a sunroof. <laughs> unintentionally. Okay? And so, there's people going to say stuff. I can't clap back at anybody say something. Amen. Somebody, uh, uh, you, let somebody say, I'm going to clap back. No, no, sometimes when you clap back, you show your immaturity. Amen. Sometimes you just got to know, I was born for this. I can take it. Come on, you got to be like a good, forget a Rolex. You got to be like a good old Timex. You got to be able to take a licking and keep on ticking. And some of you, you're going through something right now, but you were born for this. Everybody don't like you, but you were born for this. You're in a new position on your job, and people talking about you, but you were born for this. Glory to God. Uh, 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 pe pe people don't like the fact that, that they... And I did a message years ago called Pulling Away from the Crowd. Because when we start our ministry, every Tuesday I got together with pastors. We all had about 25 members or less. And we, everything was good. And when you pray for me and I pray for you. You commiserate and I commiserate. Then all of a sudden, the God started blessing. Our church started growing, and people started coming from everywhere. I don't know where they was coming from, and y'all know I ain't from here. I didn't go to every, 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 night, every, then, every now and we, then we meet somebody. Yeah, I remember you from Eau Claire. No, not me. <laughs> no, you can't see clear. <laughs> I didn't go to Eau Claire. I went to St. Aloysius in Jersey City, New Jersey. I remember people, no, I didn't go to, no, no. Well, I didn't grow up with anybody, okay? And all some people coming from everywhere. You know, people start saying stuff like, I'm stealing members. Uh, I mean, like, 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 like y'all are, like are objects, you know? And like, I kidnapped you. You go to jail for kidnapping people, okay? People start saying all this. And everything was fine. Everything was fine when we all had a little 25 people. When God started blessing us and I pulled away from the crowd, all the talk started. But I realized... I was born for this. We can rebuild a $15 million sanctuary. And I got colleagues telling me, don't build that big today. Now they got 3,000. They say, don't build for, don't, don't, don't. They say, people aren't coming to church today like that. 
They say people don't give like that. They say especially black people don't give like that. Well, I know they're a black liar. Come on now, because God's not a God of color. He said, all the gold is mine, all the silver is mine. He don't care, he don't care what color you are. He just wants you to believe, do you believe me? That red, yellow, black, or white, I'll give you green. And so I can get moved by what other people say, or I can realize I was born for this. So as I wrap this up, let me, for real, for real, for real, this time. This is it. Acts 20, verse 20 through 22. Paul getting ready to go to Jerusalem. And they said to him, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. You go to Jerusalem, you might be put in prison. You may be beat. Everybody's not going to receive you. People are going to lie on you. And look at Paul's response, Acts 20, 22. He said, I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem. I do not know the things that shall befall me there. He said, God sent me, and I don't have a weather report. He said, save or accept that the Holy Ghost witnesses or has told me down on the inside of me that bonds and afflictions abide me everywhere I go. He said, everywhere I go, I might be put in prison. I may be persecuted. But here's what I love, he says, but none of these things move me. Glory to God. Paul said, bring it on, bring it on, bring it on. Whatever it takes, bring it on, because I was born for this. He said, I don't count my life dear to myself. I'm going to finish my course with joy and the ministry that I received of the Lord to testify the gospel of grace of God. I'm going to do what God called me to do. I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me. If I perish, I perish, but I'm going to see the king. I was born for this. Everybody's not going to like it, but I was born for this. Everybody's not going to jump in my car, but I was born for this. Everybody's not going to follow me on Instagram, but I was born for this. Everybody's not going to contribute to my ministry, but I was born for this. Everyone's not going to know why I'm so persistent in doing what God told me to do, but I was born for this. It was an old song. If you get a chance, you can watch it on Hulu, Amazing Grace, which is the recording of, of Aretha Franklin recording the greatest gospel album of all time, Amazing Grace, in California. But Jane Cleveland is on there. And Jane Cleveland wrote a song. Wrote a song that said, I don't feel no waste high, Lord. I come too far from where I started from nobody told me that the road would be easy but I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me come on stand with me 